Hey, everybody. Welcome to Trek in Time. If you're listening to us, you probably know by now that this is the podcast that takes a look at Star Trek in order and in history. What I mean by that is we're taking a look at each episode of Star Trek in chronological order. So we're still very early days. We are at the doorstep of the end of season one of Enterprise. So chronologically, we're about to take a big leap forward into year two. We're also going to take a look at how things were in the world at the time of the original broadcast. And then we'll take a deeper look at to either something in the episode or something about the era, whatever catches our eye. And as usual, I'm joined here by my brother, Matthew. Matt, say hi. Hello. Matt is the tech guru and inquisitor behind the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell. And I'm Sean Farrell. I'm his brother and I'm a writer. I write some sci-fi. I write picture books. I write books for younger readers. So between the writing and the teching, we've got Star Trekking. Don't forget there are ways you can directly support the podcast. You can visit trekintime.show and there's an opportunity there for you to throw some coins at us. They hurt a little bit, but we appreciate it. And of (laughs) course, you can just listen. You can subscribe. You can watch us on YouTube. Before we get into this newest episode, Matt, I understand you have some listener comments that you wanted to share. Yeah, there's a couple. Uh, One from Robotrav. Um, Always leave a comment on every single video. Thank you so much, Robotrav. Yes, thank you, Uh, Robo. Yeah. Yes, this was a this was a reference to the last episode that we talked about, where Trip and the captain were going across the desert. Yes. Um, yes, this was a good old fashioned trek, right down to the last lackadaisical alien costumes. Who doesn't love a nice desert crossing? I still think Picard and Wesley did it better, though. Yes. With that drunk shuttle captain. Anyway, another great show, guys. Looking forward to the next one. I thought that was a. A apt comic. I completely hadn't been thinking of, you know, Wesley and the captain being stranded on the desert planet when mm-hmm. I was watching that episode, but that is true. That I think is a far better episode than this one. Um, the other comment was Pale Ghost 69. The main thing I have to say about this episode was the whole foreshadowing about the survival training since the beginning, which apparently didn't contain any actual survival tactics. Yes. <laughs> you brought that up when we were talking, which yeah. was they taught they made a huge point about that survival training, and then in the episode they did none of it. Like yeah. there was there was nothing about Survival tactics. Like, oh, come on, don't you remember that survival training? And here's your thimble of water. Now let's walk across the desert at noon. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Frustrating episode. So today, speaking of frustrating episodes, we're going to be talking about two days and two nights. Matt, do you want to give us a synopsis of this groundbreaking episode? (laughs) Okay. Yeah, I think I'm maybe showing my cards a little too soon, (laughs) but let's get into it. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Captain Archer and the crew of the Enterprise take shore leave on Ryza. It's about time. They've been teasing Ryza for yes. two episodes now. Yeah. More than back that. on their yeah, back on the spacecraft Enterprise, Phlox enters hibernation while T'Pol keeps an eye on the starship. Yes. <laughs> to give you Hi, Jinx a, and Sue. <laughs> yes. To give you a brief window into the magic that is this podcast, that is a slightly revised version of the synopsis that is available on Wikipedia. The part that I removed from it was the additional sentence which said, guest stars appear in this episode portraying the aliens that the crew meets. I'm not sure why that would need to be said, but there you have it. <laughs> it actually made me wonder... Are some of these guest stars like like really remarkable names that I should look up and see who they are? No. No. <laughs> Somebody just thought it was important to point out that if you're watching this show, there are people appearing on the TV who are not regulars. So Thanks for clearing that up. <laughs> take that for what it's worth. Yeah. So this story was originally by Rick Berman and Brandon Braga, as usual this season. Most, if not all of them, have been uh, crafted with their involvement. The teleplay was by Chris Black. And this episode is directed by Michael Dorn. And of course, we all know Michael Dorn from Chips. Mr. Woof. Yes, I jokingly (laughs) referred to Chips instead of Mr. Worf. This was his first time helming Enterprise, but it's not his first time helming an episode of Star Trek. Prior to this, he had directed several episodes of Deep Space Nine. So that's something for us to look forward to 
in approximately 10 years when we get to <laughs> the next generation and Deep Space Nine episodes. This episode aired on May 15th, 2002, and it got a modest 5.6 million viewers. As far as other things going on in the world when this episode aired, well, Matt, you were still dancing your little heart out to Don't Let Me Get Me by Pink. And the number one movie, it was still Spider-Man by Sam Raimi with Tobey Maguire. It was pulling in an additional $71 million. On TV, people were tuning in to Friends. How many people were tuning in to Friends? 34.9 million. Oof. Which made me think, what could this have been? And my speculation without doing too much research is that it was a season finale as opposed to, um, for a moment I thought perhaps the show was ending. Perhaps this was the series finale, Friends. I say that because I did not watch Friends. But... Upon some research, it looks like they would go on for two more years. So my expectation is a mid-May episode. This is probably a season finale, which pulled in roughly seven times as many viewers as Enterprise. So it's trying to be the little engine that could, but sometimes it can't. In the news, the day this episode aired, in the New York Times, the UN broadens the list of products that Iraq can import. Air testing after September 11th attack is both perplexing and reassuring. That's a headline that would not age well <laughs> in New York City. As we moved forward, it was discovered that air quality was much poorer early on than was originally reported. And illness became an ongoing concern, not just for first responders, but for people who had returned to live and work in those areas before it was truly safe. And there was also this headline, the pre-attack memo cited bin Laden, the classified memorandum written by an FBI agent in Phoenix last summer urging bureau headquarters to investigate Middle Eastern men enrolled in American flight schools also cited Osama bin Laden by name and suggested that his followers could use the schools to train for terror operations, government officials said for the first time today. The memorandum said terrorist groups like Mr. bin Laden's might be sending students to the schools as the first step in what could be a concerted effort to place Islamic militants in the civil aviation industry around the world as pilots, security guards, or aircraft maintenance workers. This memo would eventually become one of the main bits of ammunition aimed at the Bush administration and a claim against their ability to correctly interpret the information that was already on hand warning about the September 11th attacks. And of course, the Bush administration would use this kind of memo as evidence to say, not exactly the opposite, but to say, well, information like that isn't going through channels properly. So we need a Department of Homeland Security, which will unify all of these different threads of information, bring them under one review and be able to create a fuller picture. So this episode, real quick, Matt, before we get into particulars, <laughs> Do you have any big thoughts that you'd like to share? My big thoughts was I hated this episode. <laughs> yes. This this I, I up to this point I don't I don't recall if I've actually said the name of the episodes. It's two days and two nights. And as those of you checking out this episode will already know, my suggested title for this episode is Two Plots Too Many. Yes. It is oh yeah. This is four plot lines. And Matt, in the past three weeks, I believe, it's been one of the themes I have been repeating for three weeks is, wow, this episode was written in a way where the A plot and the B plot are so tightly intertwined that even though you do have two distinct storylines, they don't feel different from one another. They feel like they're part of one great current. And that is what captures you as a viewer and lets you really invest in the storyline. This episode is a perfect example of how to fracture your audience's attention to the point where you don't care about any of the storylines. Exactly. This is four separate storylines, none of which is truly worth our attention, except for hints of nefarious activities regarding the investigations of the Suleban and the potential, an agent who may potentially be from the planet that had held Archer, 
in a previous episode when he helps the Suliban escape, the planet that they were on was investigating the Suliban. That's what they were trying to do. And I think that this is this is a strange tangential connection for me to the article I just talked about, about investigations of terror plots and how do you recognize a threat when you see it. If Archer is crossing paths with somebody who is from that planet and in trying to investigate the Suliban's involvement in terror attacks in the area, clearly that's intended to be an echo that will carry forward into future episodes. They're clearly seeing this as an ongoing thing to build from. And to me, it seems born of the era that at this point, mm -hmm. at the end of the season, they're looking at a world that is now post 9-11. They're just probably barely out of it themselves. When this was filmed, it may have been months earlier, but yeah. they potentially are looking at a world that is different than when they started this entire series. And this part of the storyline feels to me like it's reflective of that. But other than that one element, there's not a whole lot here to hold on to as far as like through lines, important plot moments. And in fact, some of what we'll get into I found a little bit embarrassing. Yeah, no, there's there's one plot line in this that should have been excised and it's just an embarrassing storyline completely. Is it the um, Night at the Roxbury storyline? Yes, it is. Uh, that one. Uh, but also what came to mind watching this episode in The Next Generation, there's an episode similar to this that's executed far better where Captain Picard goes on vacation and a whole bunch of hijinks of Sue around uh, come around from his time trying to relax and go on vacation because he's basically told you have to go on vacation. So he goes on vacation and ends up in this whole like archaeological dig, yes. like Indiana Jones. Indiana plot Jones line. adventure. Yeah. And it's and it's all focused on him. It's like one main plot line of his adventure going through what he's going through. And there are B, there's a B plot line, but it's mainly him and it focuses on him and his character development and why he is the way he is. And it, and it explores him as a character. It was I thought enjoyable. This one, they split it up across four different plot lines. None of them, they were all so superficially thin. There was no real character development. There's the Night of the Roxbury storyline with Trip and uh, Reed. Um, Hoshi could have been more interesting. If they just focused on her, it would have been more interesting plot line to yeah. develop her character a little bit more. But because hers is so skin deep, it's just like, a oh, she had a one-night stand. Good for you, Hoshi, I yeah. guess. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a so way like, to there's all, go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's all these plots that happen. And the only one that really had any kind of resonance was the captains. And even that one was given short shrift and not explored well at all either. Yeah. So it's, everybody got a, a kind of a turd sandwich. <laughs> yeah. Here. And and for me, not, and this will not be high praise. For me, if I had to rank the storylines, mm -hmm. I would rank Dr. Phlox's at the top. Yeah, yeah, that was an enjoyable one. I would put Hoshi's and Archer's almost neck and neck. Yeah, I there would you go. actually argue yeah. that Hoshi's is better done yes. than Archer's. And then dead last, I'd put The Night at the Roxbury. So let's get into the plot so that we can actually clarify for those people who may not have rewatched this episode what we mean by The Night at the Roxbury. It's February 18th, 2152, which puts this just six days after Archer and Trip have been on their desert crossing, which I find it fascinating that they would lump so many of these. They went for episodes without referring to a date at all. And I, through my own speculative, well, this looks like it might be every two weeks. That was mm -hmm. my assumption. So every 14 days, another adventure is, in, is occurring. At this point now, they're lumping all these episodes all, we're only halfway through February and we've had three episodes take place in the first half of February. So at this point, I would think that Captain Archer is almost dead. <laughs> they finally arrive at Planet Risa and in the description I'm working from, it says half of the Enterprise's crew prepares for shore leave. That's exactly how many storylines this felt like. <laughs> Captain Archer is reluctant to go. This is the really the only plot element that reveals any kind of character around him. Mm -hmm. He, at the very beginning, does not want to go. 
and is arguing with DePaul. And DePaul is in a nice bit of character development between in, in their relationship. She's she's effectively saying, you have to do this, otherwise you will become burnt out to the point where you won't be able to do your job. And so the two of them are going at it a little bit, and then Archer has an awkward moment where one of the crew members who is staying behind makes a comment about, like, you're going on shore leave, you're going to have a great time, and Archer has to pretend that, yes, he's looking forward to it, even though he hasn't been. So they're setting up the idea that Archer, out of a sense of decorum, thinks it's inappropriate for him to be going on shore leave. Meanwhile, Sato, when it comes to her desire to go on shore leave, reveals for her starting point more of an issue of even though it's a vacation, for her it's almost a working vacation. She's looking forward to doing stuff to challenge herself around learning alien languages because the universal translator, she feels, has been doing most of the work for her. So here we have the reluctant vacationer and then we have the workaholic vacationer. And then also aboard this shuttlecraft are Commander Tucker and Lieutenant Reed, who apparently have taken pills to emotionally regress them to about the age of 14. Yes. Where all they can think about are boobies and wanting to touch said boobies. <laughs> and from the moment they appear on screen, their dialogue sounds like it was written by a prepubescent boy. Yes. In a way that just, this is the night at the Roxbury storyline. The two of them going to basically nightclubs, looking to score, and doing it in a way with tongues hanging out of their mouths, rolling eyes as women walk by. Yeah, oogling a women. A depiction of, of yeah. malehood that is so off-putting that as I watched it, I thought, maybe I'll just scroll on Twitter for a while while this storyline is taking place. It yeah. is yeah. off-putting my, and uncomfortable. My, my reaction when all the, their star lines were going on was, well, this didn't age well. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I kept thinking as I was watching their, their, their storyline. I don't think it aged well moments after broadcast. I yeah. think this is a, the, the depiction that they are showing is, I mean, one of the things about the sexuality and sex positive aspects of the original Trek. And like, I think we can, we can say definitively the original Star Trek had a sex positivity message. You have Captain Kirk swaggering basically onto any planet. And if there's a woman in front of him, chances are very good. He's going to make out with her. But his swagger is on it's, it's on camera. Every time he is on camera, he is depicting a person of confidence and strength. And when it comes to that sexualized side of himself, it is already evident from who he is. This is depicting the sexual side of Commander Tucker and Lieutenant Reed as the giggling behind their hands sort of prepubescent Mm -hmm. awkwardness and an and um lasciviousness where this is the kind of behavior that draws complaints from coworkers. Exactly. And yes. they are doing this on the shuttlecraft on their way down. And and it is used as an opportunity for Sato to say, like, oh, can't you guys grow up? And as opposed to her saying, like, this is this is awful. Like this yeah. is inappropriate. The captain is sitting right there, like the way they're talking, it, the captain yeah. should have, a, have immediately said, "Like, hey, squash that. That's not appropriate." But the only the only ray of sunshine. We'll get to it in a bit. I could see the writers saying excusing it because of what happens to them, right? Later, it's kind of right. like they get their comeuppance. But I don't but agree with that. It, it effectively is like you know you you have movies like Revenge of the Nerds or Weekend at Bernie's. And there are things in there that have not aged well, things there that are, are problematic. But even the best parts, the things that have maybe not become hyper-problematic are still off-putting. Yeah. And that's, that's what's evident here, is that there's, even though they do get their comeuppance, it's, and it's, and it's portrayed at the end that now they smell and they're walking around in their underwear, but still it's it's to get to that as a punchline is not yeah. worth the dirty joke at the beginning 
And I say nope. that as somebody who loves a good dirty joke. I just love it when it's good. This is not <laughs> a good dirty joke. This is just a bad setup for a bad payoff. Yeah. So they arrive on the planet, they go their separate ways, and Archer, his plan revolves around basically just holing up in a beautiful hotel room and maybe reading and spending time with his dog. We get more Porthos on camera in this episode than we have at any point up to this episode. And if the entire episode had actually revolved around just watching him read while Porthos walks around the balcony, it this would better. have been my favorite episode. <laughs> yes. Unfortunately, that's not what happens. But we do get a nice moment of Archer is on his balcony and he's being barked at by a little dog from another balcony and it turns out there's a woman staying in that room and there's a moment of eye contact and it's clearly a flirtatious moment between Archer and this woman whose name is Kayla. Meanwhile, Sato is doing her best to interact with various people at restaurants as she's having lunch. She strikes up a conversation. This is one of the nicer scenes, I thought, mm -hmm. just showing yeah. her interacting and trying her best to speak in Ryson. And the response being, most people don't even bother to try. Your accent is excellent. And it's, it's a nice little humanizing moment. And she catches the eye of another alien whose name is Ravis. And Ravis invites himself over to her table and again, in what I think is a nice bit of writing, there's a relationship built here that feels, not only does it seem organic, Ravis is not overly aggressive. He's, he's interested in her as a person because of mm -hmm. what he has overheard. You have this ear for languages. That's fascinating that you're able to do this. And he engages her in conversation and challenges her to be able to learn his language, which when he speaks it, just the name of his planet is sounds like it's about 12 words long. And he even makes the suggestion that if he tried to slow down the pronunciation to help her be able to get, grab what he was saying, that would change the meaning. So here's a challenge for her. as She's hearing this kind of language for the first time. And she's really captivated by the idea. And he also is very clearly interested in her and invites her to dinner, which she does accept the invitation. So there's a nice bit of writing around that. There's an interesting setup between Archer and Kayla that I think ultimately doesn't pay off. Mm -mm. But then meanwhile, you got Reed and Trip, go to a club. We're going to gloss over these bits of the episode as quickly as possible. <laughs> yes. But when I say Night at the Roxbury, it is effectively Night at the Roxbury. They are standing next to the bar, they are drinking, and if any woman is unlucky enough to walk past them, the two of them ogle and undress with their eyes to a degree that would probably make a bouncer ask them to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so where do these storylines end up going? Oh, meanwhile... We have another storyline. I forgot there's four plot lines here we have to yeah, summarize. Yeah, you forgot what's going on the ship. Meanwhile, on the Enterprise, <laughs> in a really poor choice of timing, Phlox has to hibernate for two days. This doesn't seem problematic at all. No, what could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong when you're, it turns out, only doctor aboard yes. the ship has to become comatose for 48 hours and the appearance of Crewman Cutler as the only replacement to which she says, I know where the bandages are. Well, that just leaves the crew in really great shape. <laughs> this will be the last time we see Crewman Cutler. As we've talked about her before, the actress who played Crewman Cutler sadly passed away due to an unknown heart ailment. And it would be in November of this year that she would pass away. So the development of her relationship with Phlox in a previous episode, her reappearance in this episode, um, I think it was evident that she would have appeared in more episodes. Yeah. And I think she was a fine actress and a bit of sadness that this is her final appearance. But she is supposed to be the one who is holding the stethoscope while Phlox is unconscious. And he is literally injected so that he can retreat to his cabin and go comatose for 48 hours and says, 
only in the direst of emergencies wake me up. So, dum dum dum. Do you think yeah. they're laying out a plot line? Back on Risa, we have Archer who begins to strike up conversations with the neighbor, Kayla, who it all begins with her dog managing to get to his balcony and in a how? bit of strange, <laughs> yes, how does she? How does the dog get up there? But it also in a bit of strange canine acting, we are shown two growling dogs that look so awkwardly uncomfortable that you spend most of the time looking at these images of the dogs growling at each other and thinking, what kind of prosthetic did they put in those dogs' mouths to make their lips curl like that? Why did the dogs look so unhappy? Yes. Why did they look a little afraid? I why did Captain Archer take so long to pick why does Porthos Captain Archer? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> why does he stand there for so long just kind of considering the fact his dog might bite this other dog? <laughs> He pulls his dog away from the other one and then answers the door to find Kayla is there saying, I'm sorry, but I feel like my dog has shown up on your balcony. They, of course, strike up a conversation. This because is intended her, to be the meet cute. Because her dog can fly. Yes. <laughs> I also fully enjoyed the fact that this is, she's she marvels at the fact that humans from the Enterprise are so far away from home. There is There are some lovely moments of writing mm -hmm. in this that ultimately are almost like any romantic comedy. It felt at times a little bit like a Lifetime movie of showing this relationship developing. And I imagined if it was the only plot of the episode, you could have milked a lot more energy from the fact that they clearly do like each other. This first meeting is he's asking about where he might eat. He invites her to dinner. She reluctantly says she can't. She reveals that she has loss in her past. And when he, when he basically plums her for a bit too much information, she reveals that her family was killed and it turns out it was through a Suleban attack. And I think that in a longer format for just this story, you could have developed what would look like a legitimate relationship between the two of them. For With the a mystery turning behind point it. To become, yeah. For the turning point of her seeking information to really sting. And the episode intentionally leaves it hanging as to whether she is in fact ever interested in him or not she knocks him unconscious but there is there are moments where it seems like she may be doing things for her own reasons but that she does legitimately like archer so i mm -hmm. think that that could have been played with more but what we're left with is the simplicity of a plot that looks like she's some kind of agent who's been playing him for a fool and one of the funniest moments for me is her marveling at how far away from home the Enterprise is, how their explorers, some, he refers to them being dozens, you know, it's 90 light years, I think he says, away from home. They're so far away from Earth that when they use a telescope to spot our sun, he points out our sun to her by saying, see the really bright blue star. Now look below that to the very dim yellow pinpoint. That's my home. And yet she has a dog that's from Earth. Yeah, I didn't understand the whole dog the thing. The simplicity I did not of understand the dog thing. Just, okay, you are painting this actress. She's got effectively leopard spots down her neck. This is another case just like last week. You put a chin tattoo on somebody, they're no longer human. We understand this is a TV show. It's being made by humans using humans. Matt and I are both smart people. We understand. You have to do that. But put some antenna on the dog. Yeah. Give the yes. dog wings. fake little funny wings. Yes. Something that would indicate like this is not a dog. This is yes. not simply a human, an earth dog. Yeah. Because she's carrying around this earth dog and then says, you're so far from home. I've never heard of earth. I've never seen a human. But I have one of your dogs. But I have one of your dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the, the Sato plot line, largely pointless, but yes. I thought nicely rendered. 
I mean, it was nicely written. As I mean, you, acted. you get Sato, yeah, you get Sato. But there, was, there, there was nothing there. Yeah, there was nothing there. No character yeah. development or evolution that I got a sense of at all. It, there yeah. was no payoff to what happened. Yeah, she talks with Ravis. He makes a comment that something that she says in his language would mean to kiss, and it becomes the moment where they cross that line into romantic, mm -hmm. and. Felt very natural, very, very nice. And then it turns out to cut to the end, they sleep together. She wakes up with him in bed next to her and it's her last day there. And he says, what would you like to do? Risa has so much stuff to offer and she says, I'm happy where I am. So a nice romantic entanglement, which is by both of them, completely understood to be effectively a one night stand. And mm -hmm. they're just enjoying each other's company as adults. And it's really kind of like, well, great. But what's the point? Meanwhile, meanwhile, back at the Roxbury, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Trip and Reed are approached by two women who are beautiful, scantily clad, approach them. They start to have a conversation. Anybody who's ever seen any kind of movie ever, anywhere, at any time in history can see what's coming. Yes. These are con people. Whatever gender or planet they're from, none of that is explained. But they convince the two Enterprise crewmen, hey, there's beautiful underground luminescent gardens we can show you. They take them into literally the basement of the club. Reed and Tripp are clearly acting drunk. So that's supposed to be the reason for their gullibility here. They're taken downstairs. And the mugged. two women turn back into <laughs> aliens, yep. which, again, they were supposed to be aliens in the first place, but now they are supposed to be ugly aliens. So now we understand ugly is evil. That's right. They look a little bit like Nosferatu. So yeah, they're like vampires. A little bit like <laughs> vampires. Could have been an interesting moment to reconnect to the vampire storyline that we had in one of the first episodes of the season where space vampires were draining people of their fluids. Could have been something more dangerous, more nefarious. Could have been something, could have been anything really. But it's literally they're looking for valuables and when they don't find valuables on them beyond their, their communicators, they take their clothes. Because we all know in the future there will clothes be nothing 20. more valuable than Hawaiian shirts. That's right. Stripped of their clothes, the two men are then stunned, knocked out, tied to support columns, and apparently the club runs in a way where nobody who works at the club will ever go into the basement. <laughs> That's the kind of club you want to run. Yeah. I'm going to put a lot of wine and a lot of liquor in the basement. That's where we're going to store it all. But don't ever go down there because the two of them wake up. Yep. The club is closed and nobody ever goes in that basement. No. Nobody stumbles they have to across break their them. Way out. They have to break their way out. The way they do it is to break a glass. They break a bottle, which has something that is described as being smelly. So now here's the big punchline to the setup of them wanting to go out and score. What's the punchline? They now smell like poopy. Or something. And they're walking through the club in their underwear. In their underwear. Yeah. Which the punchline of that is completely lost by the fact that most of the women in the club are already wearing nothing but underwear. <laughs> this is this is the punchline of this moment could have been they walk out of the basement confidently in their underwear because they know they will still blend in. But that's not what's done. They now smell bad. They've spent their entire away time tied up in the basement. None of this makes sense. None of it is entertaining. None of it does anything for these characters. None of it has repercussions beyond the scenes in which it takes place. It really is a nothing burger. Can you tell I didn't like this episode? The, the funny part about this is for the past two episodes when they've been teasing Reza and going there, every time it comes up, Trip is always like his tongue ends up hanging out of his mouth like, oh yeah, I'm going to go score. And mm. they at least stayed true to that. Yeah. Even though overall it felt out of character for both those guys. It didn't make any sense. Meanwhile, back aboard the Enterprise, 
we all knew Dr. Flox wasn't going to sleep for 48 hours. I knew that, Matthew. You knew that. Mm -hmm. Everybody listening knew that. Everybody who watched the episode knew that. Everybody who made this episode knew that. Turns out Mayweather, who was going down to the planet, very excited about rock climbing on a because, rock on, face that would hold, hold change on. shape. And hold I'm on. just now beginning to realize that maybe we have five plot lines in this episode. Yeah, yeah. Hold, hold on about the Mayweather thing. Mayweather, a spacer who grew up on a spaceship, wants to go rock climbing. Rock climbs. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> really, as soon as he said, I can't wait to go rock climbing, my first thought was like a record scratch of like, really? Yeah. You rock climb? You yeah. grew up and have lived in space your entire life and you rock climb? Yes. Come on. The guy who knew how to locate the spot on a ship where the gravity would be inverted. Yes. Rock climbs. Wants to go rock climbing. And not only does he want to go rock climbing, he goes rock climbing on a rock face that is described as shifting and then is stunned when at the middle of his climb, his handholds also change. And he falls, injures his leg, and is given medicine at a Ryson hospital, which they've never invo- they've never encountered a human before. He begins to have a bad reaction to it. This puts medical practice in the future into a really strange lens, where mm-hmm. a person from a place where you have no experience is treated by doctors with a well, what's the worst that could happen if we inject this thing into him? Mm-hmm. All right. Mayweather begins to have a bad reaction. It turns out that what he's been injected with, he is deathly allergic to. And as his vital signs begin to become more and more redlined, to Paul and Cutler come to the reluctant conclusion, we have to wake up the doctor. In doing so, here are some of the only highlights of the episode. The Very comedy funny that moments. comes out of Flock's yes. performance is fantastic. He's fantastic. In this. this is his immediate wake up is to start screaming things about I don't care how much it weighs or some other nonsense. Falls semi back to sleep. He has to be encouraged to get out of bed. He yells to sick bay and then immediately falls on the floor. It's full he, of literally he, Pratt he, falls and physical comedy. He from, calls everybody captain. <laughs> he calls everybody captain. <laughs> it's literally the only highlight of the episode. And again, to cut to the chase, despite the fact that he is coming across as effectively drunk, sleep deprived, can look impaired in the same way that drinking is impaired. Despite this, to Paul and Cutler just stand by and let him do things to Mayweather, even though he's calling everybody captain and is clearly out of his gourd. He ends up being right, which is in one regard a demonstration that, yeah, he's a great doctor because even impaired, he is able to figure out the solution. But it calls a lot of things into question about what would they do if he was ever injured? Right. They're literally just standing around with no idea of what to do. In the end, Flox is able to handle Mayweather's issue, put him back on the right course, and then immediately, in the final bit of comedy for the episode, staggers off camera while to Paul and Cutler talk for a moment. And then when they look across the room, they find Flox is asleep face down on one of the other beds. And it's understood. He'll remain there for the next 36 hours, probably. Meanwhile, back on Risa, Archer is having his final conversations with Kayla, which revolve around her beginning to sound like she's really pumping him for information. She really desperately wants to know details about the Sulaban, how they operate, how many of them are in the cabal, where they're located, how many ships they have, and so forth. And he becomes concerned to the point where he takes a scanner out of his bag, runs a bioscan, and then comes up with an excuse to separate from Kyla for a while. And during that time, he shares this scan with T'Pol, who confirms his suspicions. This is, in fact, a Tendaran, which the Tendarans are the people that had captured Archer and Mayweather those many episodes ago with all of the Sulaban who were in an internment camp. So... When confronted, this is where the writing takes a very awkward and 
confusing turn, Archer confronts Kayla with, I know who you are and what you are. She denies it constantly and then scratches mm-hmm. him with a fingernail, which knocks him out. And then she leaves. She leaves with a comment about how kind he was. It's, me- it's meant to show that she actually did start to care for him and right. d- didn't want to do bad on him. And so it's like, I understand what they were trying to do. It just did not work. It just, it leaves the scenes prior to it in a very confusing light. It doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like we've actually been introduced to Kayla, the character. It feels like we've been introduced potentially to one version of a character that might be nefarious, but Mm -hmm. without there being a very clear and definitive landing to that storyline, we're left a little confused. And at the same time, we're left a little confused. I was left with a sense of, I'm confused. They clearly intend this to be something that will be picked up in the future. And never do. But I couldn't find myself interested enough in whether they ever would. The well, way it did. leaves off, the way it leaves <laughs> off is just like, <laughs> oh, they are clearly laying a plot line for a f- potential future story, but this was so uninteresting that I don't care if they ever do pick it up. So just to kind of like get to the very end bit here, because this is all where all the plot lines end. And when they come back together, the entire crew is on the shuttle pod going back and none of them are willing to share what happened to them on the yes. trip. Yes. And to me, this is the most confusing part about this episode because at this point, I don't understand what the point of the episode was yes. because they could have tried to, if they had bookended it with something stronger, they could have made a case for why telling the story this way would have worked, but they didn't. The only thing I took away was what happens on Riza stays, stays on Riza. On Riza. Yes. And it's like, that's not anything to make an episode about. And that's all it was. This was a big nothing burger of an episode that had no point whatsoever. If it had ended with Archer calling an executive staff meeting and he has his main officers in front of him and he lays out the fact that he effectively was knocked out by a potential Tandaran spy who was trying to plumb him for information and his takeaway is that we need to be extremely cautious because there are people plotting against us potentially. Yep. And then Sato's response was, well, not everybody out here is nefarious. Some of the people out here are as curious about us as we are about them. So we shouldn't necessarily see specters where there are none. (laughs) And then Reed and (laughs) Tripp's response is, and sometimes we can find that we're going in fully charged and ready to go, but find we're not prepared. Yep. There could have been a summary of those storylines, as you're suggesting, into a way that would say, oh, we've all learned a lesson, and maybe if we put all of that information together, it creates a big picture for what Enterprise is doing out here. But exactly. instead, like you said, they all bite their tongues. Totally questionable, so especially from the captain. The captain yeah. has literally been knocked unconscious and found out potentially about a plot. And he's not sharing that with his major officers. It doesn't make any sense. You would assume that he would write some kind of report and talk to T'Pol about it and that kind of stuff, but the way that this episode, that's like subtext, that's just not even there. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, what is what is happening, Sean? Yes. This episode felt so phoned in. It felt like they were running out of storylines for to wrap up a season. Like, we have to make this number of episodes and we're running thin on ideas. That's what it felt like to me. Right. It was, it, it was just a shame. Funny you should mention that. A little bit of a deeper dive on this episode has to do with its production. It turns out that they were running out of money. Well, there you go. Originally, the episode was going to do a number of things differently. And Chris Black, who wrote the teleplay, continued to like this episode. And when this episode first aired, it actually got some relatively good marks from critics at the time. Chris Black bemoaned the fact that while he still liked the episode, and thought it held up, there were other things they wanted to do, especially with the Archer storyline, but they couldn't do those things because they were running out of, they effectively, at this point in the season, 
other than the season finale, which is next episode, they were left with not much of a budget. So they had to pare things way back. Probably explains why you see Sato in exactly three places, aboard a shuttlecraft, at a restaurant, and in a bed. Mm -hmm. Probably explains why you see Trip and Reed in a dance club and in a basement, which is probably a repurposed set from a previous episode. Mm -hmm. It's why you see Archer almost exclusively in one room, in his hotel room. Yep. So the limitations here were built in almost by what you said. If they were pressed for time and they needed an episode and they didn't have enough budget and I couldn't help but come out of this feeling bad for, my, for Michael Dorn. Like this was the episode they gave Yes, me. yes. There's nothing here. The performances are all fine, but there's, n- there's nothing here that even, I got to say, nothing here felt like it needed a director. <laughs> yes. Like you could have just set up cameras and had these people go in front of it and read their lines and it would be done. So I felt bad for Michael Dorn. Yeah, I felt bad for the actors for some of the stuff they had to do. I felt bad for me as an audience member having to watch it. I did <laughs> not like this episode. And this episode, as I said, got some good positive marks when it first aired. But more recently, as there have been things like best of lists put together and rewatch lists put together, this episode was recently put on a list of go ahead and skip this episode list for people who are doing rewatches. And I mm-hmm. completely agree. I've never seen an episode that felt quite so much as if you didn't know this episode existed, you wouldn't be missing anything. You'd probably be better off. Yes. <laughs> so I think it's pretty clear to listeners, Matt and I didn't like this episode, but what did you guys think? If you completely disagree and if any of our listeners are doing this rewatch with us. If you guys are watching along, we'd love to know that. We would love to hear from you about how you're enjoying or struggling with with episodes in particular. But this episode, if you're doing a rewatch after listening to us, I got to say... Skip it. Skip this episode. Yes. Jump right over it. Head to our next episode where it's... Get it ready, Matt. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. You ready? Yeah, I, I'm ready. I'm ready. It's Shockwave. It's a two-parter. Matt, any predictions about what Shockwave is going to be about? A wave that is shocking. Mm. I think we'll have to see. It's going to be a two-parter, and Matt and I have consulted with one another. It was a real meeting of the minds as we were just recently actually in the same place for the first time in a long time. We were in a car hurtling down the highway. <laughs> it's been a long road, I said, getting from there to here. <laughs> oh, Sean, no, please stop. <laughs> no. <laughs> so we chatted about it and decided uh, Shockwave is a two-parter. We're going to do both parts as one episode. So anybody who is watching along with us and watching ahead of listening to us, please watch both episodes before next week. We're looking forward to chatting about it with each other and hearing from all of you. Matt, before we sign off, is there anything you'd like to remind our listeners about that you have coming up? Yeah, well, I actually want to pitch our other podcast, Still to be Determined, where we do follow-up episodes on my YouTube channel episodes. (laughs) It's like an inception there a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it was a bit. Uh, I, yeah. I, had to, I passed out for a moment, so I'm just going to yeah. roll with it. But anyway, we, we just actually recorded our uh, episode about uh, nuclear fusion and follow-up uh, from viewers and questions that Sean had. and It was a fun dis- conversation, so be sure to check out Still to be Determined. As for me, as usual, I'll just remind people about my website, seanferrell.com. You can find out information about my books. My books, if any of them catch your eye, are available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any major bookstore, any small bookstore. So visit your local bookstore and ask for them by name, which is a strange phrase to say about myself. Reminder, you can visit trekintime.show. You can support the podcast there. You can also just keep doing what you're doing, listening. You can subscribe and you can leave comments or corrections in the comments through the contact information in the podcast notes on YouTube 
obviously, is just scroll down to the comment section and do it there. Please do remember to subscribe, to like the episodes, and to share it with your friends and strangers, and to come back next time. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you soon.